Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. How are you guys doing? Happy 2021, 2022. Oh, still caught up in, still caught up in 2021. Um, thank you so much for showing up this morning. Um, we're doing, we, we're hosting a tea session today, but with a bit of a difference, I think a beautiful difference we've got. Um, amazing friends from the business partners, um, the Suguma Fund who are out here with us today. And I think we're talking about something that really resonates with the needs of a lot of entrepreneurs. I think with a big aim that when you walk out of here, you would at least know how to sort of manage the compliance of your business, sort of also get an understanding to say, every time you're sort of getting a decline, a decline, a decline, a decline with no explanation, what are some of the DFIs or funders actually looking for? And then also unpacking what some of the programs, um, the technical finance, the finance that's available, what it looks like and what it sort of would look like for you to sort of access some of that funding. So thank you yet again for joining us. And I think just by, um, just, just by way of opening, restrooms are on my right. So if you're looking for the restrooms, they're on the right. Bathrooms are on the left and the right. If you want to grab a smoke, please do it on the outside. Uh, uh, sorry, on the outer area. Um, there's Wi-Fi in the room. So if you want to access the Wi-Fi, we'll actually distribute the code. Or you can ask the gents at the back wearing the black if you want to access the Wi-Fi. But thank you so much for coming out here today. And I think just, just to give some quick background, um, T. We started running tea about eight years ago, so this is its eighth year. And I think for the purpose of this particular conversation, we run workshops in townships to provide, to upskill township entrepreneurs, to create a conducive environment for them to meet each other, to network, to open up, uh, for them to learn new skills and open up whatever opportunities um, may be available in that immediate community. But most importantly, to also then foster the power of, 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 of collaboration because most of the time when we think about doing big business, when we think about great opportunities, we never think of great opportunities in the midst, where, in the midst of wherever it is that we're doing business. But you might find that if you're able to collaborate, then there's someone who's, uh, who's in here who maybe runs an event company, there's someone who's in here who runs an ice manufacturing company, there's someone who's in here who's able to provide and manufactures furniture and deco. So being able to collaborate and to find some breaking ground um, but value-added collaboration then sort of then positions you in the sort of right market. So that instead of us taking bite-sized pieces um, at a great opportunity, we could collaboratively take bigger chunks and spread the money across. But also, yet again, only if there's equal and mutual value. So over the past eight years, we've been able to directly impact over 55,000 township entrepreneurs nationally uh, with these workshops. So I guess this is the first one this year in Tembisa and during the week, um, as we'd normally host them on Saturdays. But I appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy business days, busy business day. But I think true to tea culture, if you, we would like to open up the opportunity for just three entrepreneurs, you know, who'd like to just come up and say, listen, there's a couple of people in the room and the money people are that side in the room. You can already see. <laughs> Yeah, blazers. Bla when you see blazers in the township, you must know there's money. <laughs> so the money is that side. So you're not just pitching for me and I'm going to give you a beautiful smile and wave and applause. Now they're pitching, you, they, they might say, ah, we like him. Here's a hundred thousand. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't want to put them on the spot like that. But, but I guess this is, the, this is the part in the program. I always believe um, success favors the brave. And I think this, this is at the cost of being an entrepreneur because at every given moment, you might meet the client that you're looking for, the client you've always been wanting to talk to, the client you've been wanting to poach or been reading about or looking up in Facebook and you're stuck in an elevator with them and that's your 60 seconds. What do you say to them? 
that sort of captures them so that when the doors open up, maybe they might say, here's my business card, send me an email so that we talk a little bit further. Maybe you can send me your presentation slides or your pitch deck and let's talk a little bit further. So just three, any takers? Thank you, sir, thank you, sir. Just one more. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, please, please come to the front. Let's give them a round of applause, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, 60 seconds each. Um, I'll count you down. Uh, maybe let's do this. Let me just, for this, I'll move it down this way just a bit. Perfect. So you can come in there. So just 60 seconds. Um, I'll give you a chance again. Then And then I think how we're going to facilitate this is because the crowd, the individuals who are in the room would be the consumers, you will then vote for whoever you think is the best pitch you get um, or whoever resonates the most with you. So 60 seconds, tell us who you are, what it is you do, and yeah. Okay, maybe let's do this. Before he goes on, maybe let's count it down. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's do it together. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Tebo Komoloi here, founder and CEO of Vampire Property Investments, which is the real estate company that specializes in buying and selling properties in the township market of the city of Ekuruleni. Currently, we are working on a project of sourcing property investors who can assist us to purchase properties for rental purposes. Our main challenge is that the bank institutions don't want to fund us because we are startup entrepreneurs and we don't have track records of income. So we're looking for funding to um, help us buy properties. And in terms of that funding, we are able to take it as a loan because we're using the property as surety. So if you're using your funding to buy a property, you've got surety that even if um, the property doesn't have money, but you still own equity in that property, looking at the inflation, if you invest with us, you're also going to get great returns, looking at plus minus 15% return on investment if you invest with us to buy those properties. We're also willing to give you shares in the company as, um, as returns in terms of that you own shares within our company and you're going to get great returns. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Constance Kupega, CEO and founder of Fit Munduza. We are doing outdoor fitness activities as hiking, camping. So yeah, Hana Lestres, we here to relieve it for you, get some fresh air. We also have a clothing brand where we do uh, hoodies, t-shirts, which uh, goes together with the hiking group. So what we need, we need uh, funding for more stock so that we can be able to open our own shop and be able to have stock on hand when people want to buy. You can catch us on Facebook, it's Fit Munduza. On Instagram, it's Fit underscore Munduza. Thank you. Okay, here's your juice. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, find the competition. <laughs> <laughs> smart, smart, right? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Chao Hello, and I'm the founder and CEO of a brand called, as you already see, Moga Dairy. Um, it's a company established in 2020, and we hail all the way from Katlehong. Uh, we've been in business in 2020, and um, what we produce is um, dairy products, your yogurts, and of course, your dairy plants with the plants of um, producing other cordinals, meaning your other concentrated juices. Um, we're currently in a rollout um, in, in spaza shops in the informal sectors. Um, you can find us in the um, informal spaza shops, and we plan obviously to go into the um, formal trading spaces. Um, a bit of challenges there, obviously, um, regarding the 
um, certification in health and safety. So that's our biggest challenge at this point. Um, but you can find us more um, on our website, and that's www.morgat.co.za, or you can always find us on our social medias, and that is um, on Instagram, um, uh, Morgat underscore lifestyle, and Facebook, Morgat underscore lifestyle. Funding, yes, absolutely, we need funding for us to grow. <laughs> it's hard out here. But um, yeah, so if anything you need to know, um, we also have samples for you to taste there. Um, it's more get more taste, more flavor, more quality, and that's how we do it. So let's give them all a round of applause. If I can kiss it, um, could you please just turn around, and maybe close your eyes. So I don't know, by show of hands, um, you'll sort of vote in the room for the pitch or presentation you liked, right? No, just raise your hands. How many are happy? Okay. Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, so this is our winner. So <laughs> we can turn around. So this is our winner. Thank you. So thank you so much. Um, we'll, give you, we'll give you a gift from the tea team. Shout out, thank you so much, man. So, yeah, so I, I think we always do that as an icebreaker because as an entrepreneur, you need to consistently, I think there's a couple of things that you need to do. You need to sort of align or outline what the pitch is. You know, and I think the one of some of the most important things, I think some of the most important things that you need to always consider in the pitch, you know, it's never the product, it's always the story. You know, it's never the product, it's always the story. If I sell the product, especially from an opening pitch, and I've got 60 seconds to sell it, I must sell the effects and benefits of what this thing then does. And then over and above it, you need to consistently, you need to consistently sort of fine tune the pitch so that you align the pitch in the right way. And then the third thing that you must always consider is that you must have multiple pitches because of who you're going to pitch. So it's like, if I'm going to talk to a fund manager, I must have a, my conversation. I'm a, maybe I need to be able to talk about numbers. I need to be able to talk about where we're hitting and how we're doing. Because if I talk about the fluffy things, maybe I'm irritating him and it's a nuisance. It feels good, but it doesn't mean anything. But maybe if I'm talking to a CMO, I talk to a, to, I talk to a different angle. Maybe if I talk to the lady or the head of HR, maybe I speak about it from a different perspective. So being very cognizant of who you're speaking to becomes very important because you almost, you almost then will need to consistently fine tune your pitch to whomever you're speaking to at the end of the day because you're selling different things. But as an entrepreneur, sales is at the heart and at the lifeline of your business because if you're not selling, then you're not in business. It's a hobby that you have. But if you're selling, but, but if you want to really grow your business, you need to be selling consistently selling. And I think when you sort of just basically, and I'll open up for our first speaker, I'm not even a speaker, but you then need to then also then, you know, clearly funnel out the pipeline, your sales pipeline. You need to be very clear about your sales pipeline, right? And then you also then need to then study and go back and ask yourself, for me to have gotten this gentleman as a client and he's wearing my suit, jacket, uh, how long did it take me to convert him? When you sort of utilize that as a base model methodology for conversion, then, you, then, then you'd be very clear that if it takes me three weeks to convert to one gentleman and it gives me in 30,000, and my goal is to bring in 500,000, then chances are then I might need to then speak to 30 or 40 individuals within a 30-day space for me to at least have a pipeline or a pool big enough of mixed with no's and yeses that might get me to my goal of 500,000 rand. So being very cognizant of that is important, but also... The other side of it is also then understanding one thing, to say, you need to have a sale that latches onto another sale. What I simply mean by that is, some, some, sometimes, sometimes you drop your costing, sometimes you, you, sometimes you break your operational uh, product, uh, sorry, your operational products and how you produce and how you sell them to say, I'm gonna give you just this once. But I'm going to give you this, just this one, so that it latches onto another sale. So simply put, I'm going to give you this product if you can guarantee that you'll introduce me to this gentleman and this gentleman. Because most of the time, so because most of the time we are not doing that, and then we are constantly selling a miss, and we're and we're not hitting the bottom line. But for us to then hit the bottom line, then you need to then consistently have that at the backdrop of you selling. Because sometimes you then sit there and you're like, yo, but these clients are not quick, coming quick enough. But you haven't taken the time to study the value chain or where you are in the value chain. 
What are the economic drivers that drive people coming to buy from you? Because if you clearly understand that, you would also then understand that there's no need for me to potentially even work on a Monday. Because no one's going to buy from me on a Monday. That industry doesn't operate or work on a Monday. So you're actually kissing in the dark if you're trying to do stuff without clear understanding. So doing stuff with very clear understanding becomes very important. And I think just most importantly, which is why I love our first speaker, right? Who's going who's gonna to kick it off with compliance. This then becomes at the heart of growth. Because entrepreneurs have got big hearts, we've got big stories, we want to do these big things, and then would fail at, do you have, do you, send us your text clearance, dololo. <laughs> you send us your letter of good standing, ah, uh, you know, um, send us basic stuff, you know, because that's the stuff that you always need to have on your cell phone, on a, on a Google, on Google document, or OneDrive. That's stuff that you're always going to need to have on a laptop so that when an opportunity opens up and they say, listen, it just opened up now, send us the document, we'll deal with the nuts and bolts later on, you're able to plug yourself in. But that's where we sort of miss because we've got the big passion, we've got the big drive, we've got the big amazing stories. You know that people will really sell this, but this, that's a differential conversation. That's an emotional conversation. When we start talking to, we are then going to give you, we, when we start talking about, we're not going to give you sorry, funding or grant funding or technical support. The real big question is, what do the numbers look like? Because the numbers will tell us a bigger story. What I've always said to entrepreneurs is, you take care of the finances. Just manage them as best as you potentially can. If you have an accountant, you have an accountant friend, ask them as many questions as you possibly can. Because the best pitch that will never lie, I can always lie, I can stand here and lie, but the one pitch that will never lie are management accounts and financials. Because I always said, when you study your financials, your financials will tell you what you need to sell more of, what you need to sell less of where your pain points are, what you actually need to go back and optimize your costs, which suppliers you need to talk to and try and optimize your financial cost, where you need to then sort of drop those costs so that you can align your business in the right way. Maybe our branding is not doing the way that it's supposed to because if it did, maybe it could have been contributing to the sales. But we sort of negate that and are looking at all the other things and then our conversation is, I'm not a finance person, admin is not my thing. But if that's the mindset, then you're then going to consistently chase your tail. Because part of Growing part of starting your business and growing your business is, is, is so that you can work yourself out of the business. And the sad thing is that if we are not managing our compliance, if we are not positioning ourselves in, in the right sort of sense to grow financially, whether it be for an angel investor, whether to actually build it to sell it or build it to scale and grow it, and we need to have the right sort of documents, then you find ourselves not even being entrepreneurs but full-time employed and then end up falling into depression and stress and frustration because the business you wanted to work is actually now working you. So that's a fine opener for this amazing young man, Yusuf. <laughs> let's, give, let's give him a round of applause. This is uh, Yusuf Muhammad who's just going to open up for us and engage us on compliance. The floor is yours. And then just, sorry, and then just, just one thing. So we're disappointed by our screens, uh, screen, display screen supplier. So we've got that one screen which is there at the back. So you might need to, I think apart from listening to this compliance conversation, just do a bit of exercising. You know, I know you guys don't exercise. This is the best time to not exercise. <laughs> but if you've got neck problems, it's not our bill. Okay, thank you so much for that. I am absolutely so excited to be here to talk to you today about compliance and financial statements. And let's be honest, this is not the most exciting part of your business. Most of us, when we think about it, it's like, oh no. I'm here to change that. And I guarantee you, within the next half an hour, you will come away feeling different about a topic that you might have been exposed to many times in your life. So let me start off with, with, with something else. Who wants to have a business that makes, lot of, that makes a lot of money? Give your hand, okay. Who wants to have all those nice things that we don't have? Maybe it's a fancy home. Maybe it's kids in a private school with the dog that you can walk on the streets. <laughs> Maybe it's endless holidays while you're and, and knowing that your business takes care of itself. How many of us have that somewhere, you know, at the back of our mind, it would be nice, would be nice? Now, if that's something that you really want, and you feel really connected that you think, you know, you want the good life. You know, because you've worked so hard, you know, and you always seem to be doing so many stuff. You're hustling. 
doing all that, and you feel it's time for the good life, Do, right? Then this is where we're going to start. We're going to start with compliance. But here's why we're going to start with it. We're going to start with it because of love. It's because each of you who are here today have a dream. You have a vision. You love your product. We could see the passion with the three of you who stood here, how much of passion and hunger there was. You love what you want to do, and you want to go places. That means that you love your business. Because if you don't, then maybe it's time to simply close up. And if you love your business as much as I know you do, then you'll do everything to protect it, safeguard it, give it the best chance to succeed. So when I do compliance in my business, yes, I have to do it because we want to access funding, we want to access market, we want to apply for tenders, we want to submit our business plans, we want the funders to take a look at it, absolutely. But it comes because I want to give my business the best chance to succeed. It comes from the love and the peace of mind that when you go to sleep at night, you know tomorrow morning, whatever opportunity lands your way, you are ready for it. I can't tell you how many times I come across people who will contact me at 8 o'clock in the morning for a tax clearance certificate that they need by 4 o'clock in the afternoon because they want to drop it in the tender box. And it doesn't work that way. So if you love your business as much as you say you do, compliance is an expression that you are going to protect it, care for it, and give it the best chance to succeed. So that when opportunity knocks and you say, you know what, I want to be there, whether it's funding, whether it is market, whether it's a partnership, it doesn't matter what it is, you know you're already at that door. If you can just get to that door, you'll already eliminate a lot of the other people who can't. That's the good news. I can't tell you how many times people apply for funding or they try to apply for a contract, and sometimes you have to turn them away simply because they do not satisfy the requirements on a compliance level. That immediately eliminates them. So that's quite sad, and we see that happening quite a lot. So if you love your business, that's the first thing that you should take into account. The next thing in terms of compliance, and I'm just going to share with you an easy way to understand it, is that there are three key areas in your business that you need to look at. So one is things which concern your business itself, the other is in terms of your labor, the people that you employ, and the third one is in terms of your consumers. All of them apply, but not all of them apply equally, because it depends upon what you are trying to do. Okay? If we look at business compliance, um, those of you who spend time with the youngsters will know that it's fashionable to be lit these days, right? So that's why we want to be lit, which means it's about legal industry and tax, okay? And at this level, um, in terms of legal compliance, if you think about it, you know, right at the bottom, we have your Companies Act, and that's taking care of the basic things with your CIPC. So a simple thing like making sure that every year you do the annual renewal and you complete the forms, it takes a few minutes, but it's so important because when you, when you have to apply, that's the first thing they're going to ask for. Then, of course, you have BEE, and then you have also registration for supplier for databases. Where at times, like for example, if you want to do any work in the public sector, you have to be registered on the CSD. Okay? So, so that is just a simple, a simple introduction there. When it comes to the tax side, um, income tax would always be your starting point because that's going, to, that's going to be looking in terms of your business and whether any taxation is going to be payable. If you employ any staff, then you're going to have to register as an employer and now you're going to have to deal with employee's tax. And if the business begins to do really well, then you're going to have to register for VAT. But again, not all of them apply. It really depends upon what you do and when you do it. But of course, income tax would always be your starting point for any business. And then, of course, you have industry compliance, you know, which is often permits, licenses, accreditations that might be really specific to the industry that you're going into. So, for example, if you want to get your product into a retail store, 
they might require that maybe there's certain accreditation or there is a certain license that you have to have. And that's very much dependent upon the industry that you are participating in. And again, just understand these things can take time. So in certain, in certain industries, it's going to take you a few months just to go through that process of getting your license or the accreditation. And you have to allow enough time because on the compliance side, unfortunately, things do take time. So if you don't start early, you'll find that at the time when you actually need your documentation and now you want to do it in a short space of time, it's simply not possible. Okay? Labor compliance, um, Again, you know, uh, if you're going to employ staff, you have to make sure that you comply with our labor laws. Um, so for example, a simple thing like occupational health and safety, you know, uh, that becomes your responsibility in respect of, in, in respect of the staff who you have. Uh, you also have to take into account if your staff have to get injured on duty, then you have your development, and of course, if they are unemployed, you should have been already registered for UIF. But again, these are basic things. And it doesn't really take a lot of time to set it up. And once it is done initially, then it's just about making sure that each month the returns are filed and the payments are made. Okay. And lastly, we have your consumer side of it, where, uh, where any marketing and selling of products and services has to comply with the Consumer Protection Act. And that's really just to ensure that there are no false, false undertakings or for, or for example, you go and there is a product and then you decide that, uh, that you're not gonna let a customer exchange it. And then that customer decides that now they are, are going to take you up. So again, you have to look at your industry and your product and your service. And of course, if you decide that you want to sell and you want to give terms to your customers, then you have to be aware of your National for Credit Act, which also has certain regulations if you are going to do that. Okay. And the most important thing here is that if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. Right? Um, because so often entrepreneurs say to me, no, I can't afford it. It's too expensive. Uh, why must I pay for it? You pay for it because the cost of not doing it is simply too expensive that your business can't afford it. And this happens in two ways. The next time you miss an opportunity for a tender you, or you missed the opportunity for a contract, look at the value of that and ask yourself, was it worth it? Or if you don't do it, and then you decide at a later stage, now I'm gonna do it, you know, because now my business has grown, I can afford it. We often forget that it comes at a steep cost. I sometimes meet entrepreneurs who want to do financial statements and tax returns after five years. What they forget is, it's not just the cost of doing it at that stage. It's all the penalties and interest that SARS is gonna levy. And sometimes just that tax bill that you're going to have to pay is going to wipe out your profit for the entire year. Because that is the cost of non-compliance that you still have to pay. So that's the other important reason to make sure that you're always up to date, that you're doing it each year, and to get the professional assistance if you need to. Okay. The next part that we're going to look at um, are financial statements. And... Again, you know, the aim is not for you to become the accountant in your business, but you need to be in a position where you can at least have a decent conversation with anyone about the numbers in your business. And I'm sure all of you have heard about the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow statement. And for most entrepreneurs, it means nothing. So let's be honest, it means nothing because you just go to the ATM and you check, okay, I've got 100 yen, I'm okay. Or I'm not, right? We often look at our bank account and that's where we live out of. But again, this is about understanding that if you really want to have the good life, you've got to be honest with yourself about how is the business doing. We've got to get a clear picture. We have to have a good understanding of the operations, the performance, and our cash flow. And your financial statements and your management accounts allow you to start making 
informed choices about where do you go based upon your numbers. Now, I often meet entrepreneurs who operate their business on the way they feel. You know, so they'll say to me, you know, that's a good idea, or that sounds like a good opportunity, or I just feel it's going to work out. Have you ever had those moments, you know, like where, where you just feel it, you know, like you can just feel the money, Have you, you know, or you can just feel that contract, except that it doesn't work out that way. Think about it. Think about how many times you felt it, and afterwards you were disappointed, or worse, it worked out, you got the contract, and then you ended up with no money or you didn't get paid, or you ran at a loss. So it's very important to understand while our emotions can guide us and your intuition is absolutely valuable, you want to always make sure that your numbers are added on top of that to guide your decision making. So that if you're feeling good, but my operations and my numbers are telling me, you know what, you're actually going down, then I need to do something about it. So it, so it really helps to guide a lot of your decisions that you want to make in your business so that you're not just acting based upon how I feel. You're also acting based upon what your numbers are telling you each month. Of course, once you got your numbers in place, it makes it easy to apply for funding opportunities. Almost all of the financial institutions that you apply to are always going to ask for the same information. So having it done, completed, and available just makes it so much more easier. It is also quite important that, again, entrepreneurs often say, you know, but it's too expensive, I can't do it, I don't have the time. So in terms of the resources, the SME toolkit um, if you go onto the website, it is an invaluable resource where you'll get all the templates for free. You'll get an income statement, a balance sheet. If you want to do it yourself, you just download any of the templates, enter your figures, and it will work it out for you. And it is 100% free, and it's easy to use. Of course, you could also use an Excel a sheet. You could also make use of accounting software. But the point is, at the end of the day, it has to get done. Right? Whichever way you use, find what works for you, but start doing it. At the end of it, though, just bear this in mind. Even if you complete the financial statements yourself, you can't just sign it off on your own and submit it to a funder. You, will need to have a, you would need to have an accountant who, who is going to sign it off. So for, for that purpose, I normally suggest that you do look at a professional accountant or or even a chartered accountant, and you engage their services for that. Okay. This brings me to financial statements, and again, it's a very easy introduction. So the balance sheet only consists of three things, three very simple elements, assets, equity, and your liabilities. And really what we're trying to understand there at the end of the day is what is your net worth, you know? They often say, you know, if your balance sheet is strong, you can come out of any storm. Okay? But if it's not, then the slightest breeze and you fall over. So a very simple example which I have over there, you know, um, we really what we are trying to say in this example is that you might have purchased, you might have purchased, say for example, a machine for 1.5. And that's being represented by the equity, which is your 500,000, and maybe you went and got a loan from the bank, which is for 1 million. And what entrepreneurs often, often overlook is that even though you've got that machine there, you don't yet own it, right? Because you still have to pay back on that loan of 1 million. And only when that is paid do you own the asset. So your balance sheet gives you a very quick reality check as to who really owns your business. Right? Are you owning it, or is the funder owning it, and what does it mean? So that when you apply for funding, a funder can, can, can be able to assess, can I fund this business, or are your debts simply way too high, and you know, it's, it is going to hold us back. The income statement, on the other hand, I often like to think of it as a soccer game. So whether you are a Liverpool supporter or a Man United um, and if you have to follow them, you'll notice that there are so many games each season. 
and they play the games, and at the end of it, somebody holds up a trophy, and they are the winner. Your income statement is allowing you to play the game every month, and after 12 months, we work out who is the winner of the league, right? Have you actually made a profit or a loss? Has this been a winning year or a losing year for you? And if you haven't done so well, then it's time to actually go back and relook at it. And if you've done well, well, then you want to keep doing more of it. And if you do this as part of your management accounts, then you won't wait for 12 months. And then you say, Ish, I didn't make any money, but I worked so hard. Okay? It allows you every single month to actually see, um, am I winning this game or am I losing? And the quicker you do that, it then allows you to also make some changes. So that's what the income statement does in a very simplistic terms. Bear in mind, though, that you also have to pay tax, and that's also something you have to factor into your numbers. Okay. And the last one is the cash flow statement, which tries to capture all the cash flowing into the business and out of the business from investment, financing, and your operating activities. And that's a very simple way to actually work it out if you look at opening balance at the beginning of the month and closing balance at the end of the month. And then that's a simple example. So for a lot of businesses who are starting out, you will often want to watch the cash flow from your operating activities. Because this is where you are trading, where, where now you are, you are doing a lot of work to actually push out your product, but maybe you are waiting to still get paid. So a lot of entrepreneurs, to, they tend to often get stuck when it comes to the cash flow in terms of their operational activities. And again, that tells you that something needs to change, right? Either because there might be issues with your product or your service or your customers are not paying you. Whatever the issue is, if you get to the 25th of every month and every month you provoke, you must say clearly something Something is not working out here because last month I was in the same place I was again. And you can already see that next month you're going to be in the same place again. So clearly something is not working and you need to address that in terms of your cash flow. The thing about cash flow is that you can have the best business with the best people, the best opportunities, but if you don't have cash, it's like oxygen, you won't survive. So that's why cash flow has become so important, especially in this environment, where a lot of funders will hear your fantastic stories, but then they want to look at how is the cash flow going to be able to assess can we support your business or not. Okay. And I think, you know, a key takeaway is that you have to ask yourself, do you want to be in control of your finances or do you want it to control you? Right? It can be a wonderful servant, but a really harsh master. And that's a decision you get to make every single day of your life when you go out. Now, often entrepreneurs also say, you know, I just don't have the time for this. You know, it seems like it's too much of time, I'm too busy, I'm just trying to get the business. And while that is understandable, we have to also take into account that once you set this up, it runs like clockwork. So the initial time to set all of this up might feel like a lot because you have to go and find the information, you have to begin to establish your processes, and that can be time consuming initially. But after that, every month, it begins to run like clockwork. So that you don't get to the end of each month and say, okay, what happened? You know, how did this happen to me? You already know it, and you already have a confidence about how the business is going to do. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with this thought that you could spend the rest of 2022 doing exactly what you did in 2021 and in 2020. And maybe you will do okay. But if you are serious about having the good life, and if you are serious about building a business that's going to go places, and if you are serious about taking your business to a new level, which is possible, then showing your business the love it deserves is something which should be non-negotiable. And taking care of the compliance 
is an investment in the future success of your business. When it comes to the financial side, your relationship with your finances speaks volumes. And even if you take baby steps starting right now, you will well be on the path to future success in your business. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, if you wish to obtain a copy of the presentation, you can email me. And I wish all of you the very best for the year, so that I hope when I meet you in a year's time, you'll be telling me how this was the day that your relationship with your money changed. Thank you. Let's uh, give Yusuf another round of applause. And thank you so much for that. And I think just to note, so we could either send you his presentation, but also we're streaming the, plat we're streaming the session live. So everything he was presenting, as he was presenting it is live. You can go back um, immediately after we conclude the session and watch it today, later, a week later. So <clears throat> thank you so much, Yusuf, for that. I'd like to now call up on stage. And what we'll do is for the questions that you have, please just con continue to write questions on your notebooks, on your phones, capture them. We're going to have a group engagement with all the three facilitators or presenters who are going to be presenting on different topics and then ask away so that when you leave here, you leave here with as much, uh, as many questions answered and even questions that might not necessarily be related to our conversation. I'd like to now call up on stage Arnold February. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Sir. Thank you. Yo. Thanks, my man. I must just get my presentation. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, we'll plug it in here. And he's going to be talking about what makes funding work. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Hope you are all well. My name is Arnold February. I'm the original investment manager for a company called Business Partners Limited. We provide funding as well as mentorship to small and medium-sized businesses. Um, I was still laughing of the the, the, the to token you've put on, on compliance, uh, you must love it. Normally it's a burden, but I, I like that. It speaks about the passion as well. So today I will be talking, I'll have a general discussion with you. I'll talk about business principles that are important for entrepreneurs that as an investor we want to see. And then I'm going to talk about how a company like business partners or a general institution that provides funding uh, looks at transactions and then I'll end up with the couple of reasons of why an application is referred back or rejected. All right, so just in terms of business principles, and these are generic or general points. And the first one is in business, you don't go into business to make a living or to earn a salary. That's actually not your primary reason. If you're serious about business, you're going into business to create wealth, to create assets or um, initiatives that create work for you where you are not strained with your time and your energy and your resources. That's really the core objective. And so there's a clear separation between your personal needs and your business needs. So that's the first one. The second one is, and I've heard this in a podcast, it basically said you can buy anything you want. All those nice houses that Yusuf had on and the cars and everything. You can buy everything you want, provided that the money that you use to buy that comes from assets or investments or passive income or business. So you don't just become a consumer, you first become a creator. And with that, uh, that profits of your creation, you can, then, um, you can then buy what you want. Make sense? All right. Then a lot of entrepreneurs, especially if you start up, they tend to go at it alone. All right. So a, a couple of things that we see is 
as an entrepreneur, nobody can do it better than me. All right? Arnold's, Arnold's a man. Nobody can do this better than me. Or, um, I don't have the time to train so-and-so to do it, man. I'm just going to do it myself. It is one of the biggest mistakes an entrepreneur does. And you need to see yourself as the, an important part of the business. But really, your job is to train the people, to hire the right people, to put in the systems um, so that the products and the flow runs without really you having to have a finger on every business decision. All right. Then um, there's, there's a couple of things, and I think uh, Yusuf mentioned it as well. So there's a saying that goes, as an entrepreneur, you don't have to know everything, but you, not, you must have access to people that know what you need. And you must always be learning from them. Um, so the other point, I'm going to jump between the points. The other point is, in business, um, time and money are both resources. But your time becomes a more important resource than money. Now, the entrepreneurs that pitch today, the primary objective was money, all right? which I understand because of the stage of the business. But believe me, when you solve your money problems, you only solve your money problems. You still have other issues, and your time becomes your scarce resources. So, um, a classic example, um, I know how to do uh, my personal tax and business taxes, but I pay a tax practitioner because I can't deal with the emotional stress <laughs> of dealing with, with SARS, or I don't... My, the time or that I will take to do my compliance, um, Yusuf can do in, in a fifth of the time, you know, and I can hold um, my tax practitioner accountable. So it's, very, it's a very important principle in business as well. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they pitch a business, they don't iron out what their competitive edge or the competitive advantage is really. What really makes you different? What makes your product different, your, your, your service different, or your ob core objective different? And why people want to, want to invest in you? Now, even if you start your business and you grow it big, remember you're still dealing with people. At the end of the day, people are, are people. So just bear that in mind. At the end of the day, people want to be trusted. They want to rely on you, and they want to know that your word is worth something, and the products that you offer um, is quality. In business, I heard this in a podcast. You are wasting your time if you're not solving a problem. If your business is not solving a problem, you're actually wasting your time. And that speaks to the core objective of the business and the potential um, of the and the size and potential of your business. You must be, you must be in a business with a purpose way beyond just money. Um, this is an important one. This is this is a personal uh, credo that I that I uh, that I use, and, and I want to share it with you, because entrepreneurship is hard. Right, um, regardless of how sexy they make it out to be, it's it's hard, it's difficult. But you have the additional burden of being a role model. So as an entrepreneur, you must now be consciously aware that what you do and the impact that you have on your customers and your workers and your community makes you a role model. So if you are, if you operate with integrity and if you comply, um, and you, you share your wisdom, um, and you share what you've learned, and your wealth, then you will have the, you will, you will have the, the blessings of the people that you work with, the networks that you work with. So it's a very important one for me, because entrepreneurship is not a get money, quick, rich, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, um, um, scenario. It's a burden, and you're a role model. 
So if you don't want to, to take on, if you don't want to acknowledge that responsibility, you really should question yourself. I'm, I'm speaking truth, all right? So, so don't throw stones at me. I'm just projecting the values that I think entrepreneurship should have within our country. All right, then another important point. Um, let me just get this going here. Yeah. Another important point is you're responsible for everything in your business. Unfortunately, you can't, you can't um, call somebody or, or refer, um, refer the responsibility on. Okay, so you're the captain, but you also take all the knocks. And in, in business and in finance, particularly with respect to the, in the, 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 the age in which we're in, the information age, I'm going to be, I'm going to say this as I'm going to say it, take it how you want to take it, but this was t told to me already. There's no reason for you to be dumb. The information, the democracy of information out there, it's, I mean, it is insane. Um, what you can get on the internet, on, on your cell phone, there's really no reason for you um, not to know anymore, or at least have a general understanding or a reach to people that have an understanding of what you need for your business and for your funding. And books are, I mean, you get free books on business and on funding. So um, with the democracy of information, the point of knowledge is an important point and it's part of your responsibility. Now with regards to funding, this is a very important point. Borrow, uh, borrow only what you need, but not a cent less. Borrow only what you need, but not one cent short. I would rather give an entrepreneur 10 rand more than what he or she needs than give them um, one rand short, because it will impact uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of your business. And then when you borrow money, understand that there is an opportunity and an opportunity cost of money, right? And you've mentioned the opportunity cost as well. So I'm going to give you an example. It, it normally works with an audience. So uh, it's, a, it's a simple example. I'm going to use you, sir. What's your name? My name is Tapelo. Tapelo. All right, Tapelo. So here's an example. So I, um, I assist you with your business, and I now give you a 100 rand, no strings attached. Let's, let's make it a bit more, right? 100 is solid. 100,000 rand. Will you take it? Of course. I mean, it's 100,000 rand. I mean, somebody asked for 100,000 rand earlier, right? So now, second example, second deal. Um, I get the same deal, but now you're getting 110,000 rand, but I'm going to keep the 10,000 rand and you get 100,000 rand. Will you take it? Do you see that hesitation? What is your net effect? It's the same. In fact, it's even better because now two people are benefiting from, from, from it. Okay, so there's a cost of the money, the 10,000, the 10, but the opportunity was 10 times more than that. So you have to, in business, think about money in terms of cost as well as the opportunity cost of it. A couple of mistakes that I see in, in, in business is that entrepreneurs, they borrow money for short-term uh, solutions. So they're running, they're running dry on cash, right? Uh, but technically speaking, you must only borrow money that makes you more money because there's a cost of money. So if you borrow a 10 rand, and the cost is another rand. Try and make that 10 rand into 20 rand, etc. I don't know why I'm using small figures. <laughs> I think I'm used to talking to my son. <laughs> Talk about 10 rand. Um, but but the, the principle is money must make you more money. You don't borrow money uh, to survive. You borrow money to thrive. Make sense? Okay. Then another important thing is if you're buying, if you need money for a long-term investment, 
you're buying a business that will grow and you'll really reap the rewards in five years or 10 years or an asset that has a value, um, a, 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 a lifespan of five years or a property that has, I think that gentleman is into property, so that's a 10, 20 year. Don't do short-term borrowings. Don't borrow three months, six months, short-term money for long-term assets because short-term money is very expensive and it, the, 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 the liability must match the useful life of the asset. Right. Now, this is an important one. If, if you... Let me just go back. If, you, if you're not putting in your cash and your time and your resources, how can you expect an investor to put in his or hers? You have to show commitment. We call it skin in the game. But you have to give it your all. You must be willing to put something on the line. Some entrepreneurs get rejected because they don't want to sign surety. They don't want to sign a piece of paper. I mean, we invest in entrepreneurs. If you don't believe in a business enough to sign surety, why must we fund? Then the aspect of risk and reward is very important. So... There's a correlation between risk and reward. So if you do a high-risk business, you, you only do it if the returns or the potential is high. If you do high-risk transactions or business, but the returns are little to medium, you're actually gambling. All right, so keep that in mind. And then, very importantly, so there are different types of funders out there. Does somebody want to take that... Uh, Okay. There's, the, the, there's different funders out there with different objectives. Some institutions finance because they want to, the objective is um, job creation or green initiatives or they want to develop entrepreneurs. So they've got a developmental objective and they, they're not really looking for a return on money. Other funders want to fund on, a, on the basis of viability and that uh, their money must be repaid. It is your responsibility to identify, to, to understand the spectrum of funders and to identify funders that match your business objectives. All right, let's move on. Now I'm going to talk about the, f the funding application and the success of of funding. Now, different institutions assess applications differently, but there are certain principles or fundamentals that are generic or that you can find in all institutions. So when a business application is assessed, it's usually on the pillar of at least the following three. The first one is the entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs must have skills, knowledge, networks, um, and resources within the industry or within the business that they want to operate. So you must have solid entrepreneurs that can get things done. All right? The second one is the business. So some businesses have high barriers to entry. There is a lot of compliance. There is perhaps, I think you mentioned, sir, with the juice, you've mentioned um, the health and safety aspect. Oh, sorry, you the health and safety aspects of it. So certain industries have more compliance with others. So that's something we will look at. And then also we look at at what stage you are in the business. So a business, the lifespan of a business, you start and then you grow. So there's something called growing pains. All right. So it is pains of growing that you have to identify. You just, you're not going to go from a million rand to a hundred million rand business um, with with sunshine and roses only. There is pain of doing it, and you have to evolve your business, your systems, and your efficiency accordingly. And then the third one is, if you're borrowing a million rand, uh, if you're borrowing a million rand, but you don't have any assets or collateral to offer to the funding institution against that, then the security, uh, the, then there won't be security for that loan. So the risk Financial risk is perceived to be higher, and so it might, you either won't get um, approved or the investor will approve it, but they, will take, they would want a higher return on that money. 
So this is generally the, the overview um, of all funders. There are a few more depending on the, the funding institution. Now I want to tell you about some things that I see when we receive applications and we review it. I want to tell you about some things that, that I see that you could perhaps learn from. So with regards to a business plan, um, the business plan, it's very important that, that it's clear what you do, why you're doing it, what your products are, in which industries you're funding, uh, operating, in which provinces you, you're operating. Um, I don't want a, a business plan that's this thick, that is a thesis that talks about your family members or what you've heard at a braai. You must keep it relevant to your business. I'm, I'm going to tell you this is really what happened when I was still in Cape Town. A gentleman came in and he dropped a business plan. It was really a monster of a business plan. It was a thesis, you know. Um, I think he, he thought he's studying honors and he needs to submit a report. And what happened was um, that business plan went to one of the senior investment uh, managers who reviewed the business plan. And as he's reviewing, he's telling me how irritated he is of the read because it's irrelevant information that's in there. The deal, the substance of the business wasn't sufficient for approval, so it was, it was rejected. The gentleman came and picked up the business plan. He paged to the middle, and he took a hair out. <laughs> he took a hair out of the business plan, and he said, you didn't read my business plan. There's still a hair in the business plan. <laughs> So that's a, I can't make it up. That's a true story. So um, this is how we actually operate. This is real life. So I've had a business plan that's two pages. But the substance of what I want is in there. The rest of the information I'll pick up and I'll phone you or we'll have a coffee or I'll send an email. You understand? So, so um, take the fluff out. Get to the core of selling the business and cover the fundamentals uh, in a business plan. Um, keep it simple and work with facts. So I've had a deal up on, on, on Friday that was referred back, and I, I'm just making this example. So the gentleman is importing something from China, but we, the, the, the report talks about there are various suppliers in various provinces with various prices, and he can, he can bring this in. So that's not enough. A funder wants to know the specifics. Who's the supplier? What is the cost of the funding? What is the turnaround time? What is the risk? What is the warranties? So in that example, be very, very specific. I'm going to give you another example with a marketing strategy that I've seen before. Um, somebody says, uh, we have a restaurant uh, in Tembisa. Um, there is 100,000 people in Tembisa. If we just get 10% of that 100,000, then we have so many people coming to us. And of that 10%, if 5% drink coffee, then we get that. No. A better strategy would be saying we've dropped off 100 flyers or 1,000 flyers, and we've done a questionnaire, and people show interest, and they like coffee or breakfast or lunch or supper at this price. Am I still good for time? I'm talking a lot. So what I'm saying is when, when in your proposal, be very specific uh, and, and back it with facts and evidence. Okay. Then what investors look for? We look for strong entrepreneurs who have the passion and the networks to, get to, to, get, uh, to make it a success. We do look for compliance. Um, not just tax and, and, and labor, but certain industries must comply. This is a true story again. Just today, just Monday, I rejected a business that has seven years of great profits. Great profits. Two million, three million, five million rand profits. They want to buy a property. They can afford it with their eyes closed. Brilliant. In the financials, there is no reference to tax. None. Not in the current, not in the history, and it's signed off by a, an, a, a chartered accountant, not even just a professional accountant, a chartered accountant. Now, I 
declined that deal as, a, as an agent of, of, the, of FICA because if SARS comes and SARS finds out, hey, listen, you guys made taxes for five, six, seven, um, profits for five, six, seven years, boom, here's a 10 million rand tax liability. Boom, here's another 3 million penalty and in interest. There's no way that, um, that, that we're going to take on that, that, uh, that risk. SARS ranks above everything, above every funder. So the compliance or the cost of non-compliance in that case cost that entrepreneur an opportunity of getting the property. The second thing to it is in, in liaising with the entrepreneur, he, he almost played as if he doesn't know about um, the IT34 statement or the VAT statement. That is an even worse red flag for us. An entrepreneur that's in business that long that doesn't know. So just th so those are things that we would look for um, in an application. Um, then, then another example, and this is again a real case study. Just on just Tuesday, one of my investment officers came to me and says, Arnold, I got an entrepreneur. He wants to purchase, he needs funding for, just wait for this, he needs funding for not one, but seven chicken lickens. He's never, up, he's never traded in the industry and got no money to put in. Not one, but seven. I think he thought, okay, one seven, seven, chicken licken will give me a million rand, so seven is seven million. I can do with that. I mean, that was such an easy no. It's a <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so the higher the risk means that you either won't get the funding or that the cost of the funding will, will increase accordingly. Here's a couple of reasons of why business um, applications are rejected. Viability. A business can't afford the step up. We were talking earlier about uh, one of these entrepreneurs, Yusuf, if I may, an entrepreneur that, that's running a lodge, but now needs to buy two additional lodges. So the step up is quite steep. And so the viability is not just on the affordability, but also the viability of the controlling of that application or that that uh, business, um, again, growing pains. Um, then also the loan amount, another reason is the loan amount that an entrepreneur applies for um, is out of sync with their personal balance sheet or the business balance sheet. I don't know why, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, and please forgive me if I'm stepping on toes, but I don't know why entrepreneurs regard an application for funding as some, sometimes as if it's monopoly money. Like, I've had an application, the entrepreneur wants 50 million, all right? They got 500,000 to put in, and they're gonna get money from this, that, and the other. That 50 million is repayable, um, and if business does not do well, you, you're going to have to stand for, and that 50 million might be dead for the rest of your life. So, rather, and I think you've mentioned it, so rather um, grow, within your limit, and as you grow, you expand within your control. And if you're applying for a million, 10 million, or 100 million, make sure that you can back it up with uh, your, pers your personal uh, wealth or your business wealth, if that it makes sense. Now, another reason why, um, why entrepreneurs get rejected is the lack of integrity of the information presented. I'm going to give you two case studies. Again, I can't make this up. This is real. I've received two applications within two weeks. All right? Um, I'm not even going to tell you the industry. I'm, I'm too, f too afraid you're going to guess a service provider. Those applications, word for word, verbatim, the same thing. The only thing that changed is the person that wrote the business plan changed the name of the entrepreneur and the business name. Word for word, those two business plans are exactly the same. Now, please, if you go into a, to a, um, a, somebody that's going to write a business plan for you, number one, you must vet that business plan and you must know that it's factual. And number two, go to professionals. Don't go to somebody that's going to copy paste or cookie cut a business plan and send it out to 100 bidders hoping for a response. Um, the no another one was um, financial, financial information, the integrity of financial information 
um, is this is a big problem for us. So what happens is entrepreneurs submit financial statements to a to a, f a funder like business partners, showing great profits, let's say five million. And then we ask, all right, what did you send to SARS? Can we get your IT34? Then they show losses <laughs> to get tax refunds. So the integrity of that financial information puts a burden on business partners to, to reject, and in some cases to even declare to SARS that there is some, something not right here. So just bear that in mind. Um, then uh, poor systems as well. We've seen businesses that as they grow, they just don't have the support in their system and infrastructure to, to support that growth. That's another reason. Another one is gearing. So if you, if you, the more you borrow, the more you borrow, the gearing of the business um, is such that the cash, the cash flow required to just keep the business afloat, it's basically choking the business. So you can't have too much debt in the business either. And then sometimes, this is not very often, but sometimes entrepreneurs are just not convincing enough. We also uh, reject applications in that regard because we invest in entrepreneurs. Um, all right, so let me just, I'm almost done. So in conclusion, as entrepreneurs, you are young, aspiring uh, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that's been in the business two, three, five years. Remember, the potential of your business is your responsibility, but you have stepped into a burden of being a role model. And that role model means you have to take on the, the ownership of running a business with integrity that somebody can uh, look up to uh, and that you can now build more entrepreneurs within your family or within your community. All right, because for many of you, you are probably the first generation entrepreneurs. And secondly, there's always opportunities out there. Make, first of all, see the opportunity, uh, make the opportunity work for you, make money the right way, and uh, once you if you're comfortable with your compliance and your purpose of, of being in business, then funding really shouldn't be a problem. All right, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Let's give him another round of applause. Can I, can I pull this out? Is this yours? Yeah. Yeah, um, how'd you guys find that? How's that? It's not the fluffy stuff, it's the real stuff. And I think it's important, you know, to, it's important for us to engage on the real stuff because this is the makeup of business growth. Because, I mean, how long are you going to, or rather, how long are we going to keep winging it? At some point, the systems must kick in. At some point, compliance must be managed. And I think at the end of the day, that's the burden of growth. If you want to grow and scale, then you must be accountable. You need to be responsible. You need to make sure that you, are, you, you manage your business, you know, so that you are not managed by last minute, hey, there's an opportunity. It's a text rent. If there's a last minute opportunity, my financials are not on check, let's put zero, 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 so that we can just get a quick tax clearance. Then you're working your way behind because when a really big opportunity does come, one that you are capable of delivering on, then you are, then you are not able to actually meet that opportunity at the point of its, um, at the point of its uh, benefits to you. So I'll implore you yet again, please write questions because we're going to have a group chat. So that when you leave here, you leave with all your, I guess, compliance, uh, finance, funding questions answered, and you are able to go back home and plug into your business and start really just grafting at the growth of your business. So the next gentleman I'm going to call up is going to be talking about the Technical Assistance Fund, uh, Mr. David Morove. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I think amongst the speakers here, I'm the timer, ne? <laughs> I still don't know how to reconcile with being a timer, because I still consider myself a young person. <laughs> but um, I want to maybe start off by thanking uh, the people that are here today. 
I, I had a chat with uh, Bulelani, whom I met, I think it was uh, three years ago, 2019, just before the COVID. And I was facilitating a session where entrepreneurs were giving an account of what it is that they do and how they got to be where they were. And he was one of the guys, he struck me as a, as a very impressive uh, fellow township guy. Uh, he told me what he's doing in uh, mostly the East Rand. And through Sukuma, I thought, if there's somebody to touch, it's this man. He tried to scare me that, you know, Minangbuye Lokshini. Then I said, Naming, I'm from LX. And he said, then he started calling me Brady, you know. <laughs> but thank you for this. I think it's a good initiative because for any country to move ahead, for true development to happen in any country, you need entrepreneurs. And such initiatives are so required because no true development can take place without the people of that very country participating in its economy. And it's not gonna happen in and of itself. It needs people, people who can stand up and do something about it. And I think through this initiative, we're trying to reach out to the few that want to do something and not just sit back. The one thing that we aspired to us when we were growing up was to play for the national team soccer. Because we were all playing soccer, that's all we had exposure to. How many of us actually make it to the national team? I mean, the national team usually has about 22 players, eh? 22, the main squad and the reserves. Even those, just to make it to the reserve is very few. And I want to applaud you guys for being here as entrepreneurs. Because it shows that it's only the few that actually make that cut to go to the next level and pursue their dreams with the love that was spoken about, with the attention that is required to be able to convince potential funders of whatever opportunity they are pursuing. And then, the, the, uh, I said I'm starting by thanking, I thank Dubudelani, but the, the, the people that I have here, just for them to allocate their time to be here, for me, it's an achievement. Uh, you know, he had nice uh, graphics about financial compliance. He's a chartered accountant. He's busy. He's forever all over the world, uh, all over the country. Do, and he's got a passion for entrepreneurs. I'm sure it came through. For him to afford us his time, I need to start off by saying, thank you, Yusuf. I don't want to wait until the difficult question comes. I must thank him before. <laughs> and the stories that Arnold is referring to here are no flukes. He's a busy man, I can tell you that. The fund that Gauteng runs, I think Gauteng is the hub of our economy in this country. I think about 32, 33, if not 35% of the GDP of the South African economy emanates from here. And he is the regional investment manager for that. So you can imagine the number of applications that he has to pursue through. And for me to extend this request to him and for him to be here. I want to start by thanking you, Arnold. Thank you very much. Just one last anecdotal story. I was sitting in a gala banquet situation and I'm sitting with these people around the table and you know people like to share business cards. So this one had a very interesting array or abbreviations that talked to what it is that is qualified to do but it had very interesting um, abbreviation. The first one was PSF, and the second one was ASS, and then the third one was NSE. So one of the guys around the table plucked up the courage to ask him, you know, these abbreviations are very interesting. What exactly do they refer to? And he says, PSF stands for past 10 at five. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. And then they asked, what about ASS? He says, N stand at six. <laughs> And then the last one was uh, NSE. What's NSE for? He says, now I'm self-employed. <laughs> well, the guy pursued it. I'm not saying you shouldn't study. You must get the knowledge that you require and be an entrepreneur and employ others. What I'm going to touch on on the Sukuma technical assistance, I thought, I spoke to the trustees of the Sukuma Fund about reaching out to entrepreneurs, to potential entrepreneurs, mainly those that can take 
that want to take a leap forward because you can showcase that you're entrepreneurs first by being here and also by whatever it is that you do. It was very interesting to listen to the pitch session here that people are not just sitting back waiting for things to happen. They are making things happen. And that's, in a sense, the definition of an entrepreneur, to mobilize the resources around you to, to get things done. So we requested this opportunity to reach out to entrepreneurs throughout the country. And this is one of the, I think it's the second one. I did one in another province and now this one with Bulelani. What we, I thought for this presentation, I will give you just a bit of the history or the genesis of Sukuma, where it comes from, what was its purpose, uh, what we stand for as Sukuma, and then thereafter just why the technical assistance and what is it that we will consider for technical assistance. Because it's not the funding side of a business, but it's a technical assistance side, which we are trying to expand to reach out to more entrepreneurs than we have in our fold. Under normal circumstances, what we do with our technical assistance is to provide technical assistance to the entrepreneurs that we have funded. When Arnold does due diligence on any business, there are invariably certain weaknesses that they identify. Maybe your strategy, your approach to market is not okay, or you're bringing in equipment from abroad and it needs to be commissioned, you need to be assistant there. That's how we provide that technical assistance. But we thought there are many entrepreneurs there, some of whom might like to benefit on that. So I'm gonna give you on just a little bit on the genesis of Sukuma, the principle, and why the technical assistance. We all know about the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I mentioned that I'd met uh, Bulelani in 2019, but none of us expected what would happen in 2020 when the lockdowns, hot lockdowns happens. It was an uncertain time for many small and medium enterprises. And over and above that, there have been certain challenges that we've been facing as a country. We're still facing them at the moment. I think the economy has not recovered sufficiently. Many people have lost their jobs. If you're gonna sell your product, you need people that can afford to buy that product. What happens if we're all just fighting to survive and you need to sell some to somebody? So it's a challenge for our economy, low disposable income. We have had some riots happening last year in July, and I empathize with the guys in KZN who've been experiencing floods but those have certain serious implications on our economy. The, the, the cumulative effect of such things are very, is very impactful on what happens to our small businesses. And I think, I thought it's important to just share how Sukuma came about. Around the time that Sukuma happened, there were, the president announced that there's a lockdown and there were a number of people over and above what government was pledging that gave funds to assist small businesses, and that's how Sukuma came about. In this instance, it was the Rupert family who gave one billion rands, donated one billion rands to business partners to provide assistance to small businesses during that difficult time for the many challenges that our small businesses were facing. We were asked as business partners, Arnold is my colleague, so I can attest that what he's telling you is true. We were asked to administer that fund of Sukuma, which is, which is what facilitated this session together with Bulelani, uh, for no fee. So we were doing it just to help entrepreneurs and it was, there was a clear instruction, don't help your clients, just help entrepreneurs out and about, those that were facing the challenges um, around um, the, 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 the lockdowns that we're experiencing because of uh, the COVID-19. This is not so much in the presentation, but uh, I think we, we um, uh, had an online application platform that we introduced, I think it was the 3rd of April, 2020. Within uh, three days, we were oversubscribed in terms of the number of applications that we received for relief for that thing. I think we had about 40,000 applications in three days. And it, the risk was that that site was going to crash. And then we had to shut the website and mine through all the applications that had come through to us. 
there were some challenges, and those challenges led us to facilitate a session such as this, because we saw that there are many entrepreneurs that are not able to access funding because of things like compliance, they don't have their finances in order, and then hence the request to do something like this. In spite of that, we managed to reach about 6,000 entrepreneurs in a period of about nine months. We advanced about 900 million to these entrepreneurs just to keep their doors open, to keep employees employed. But there are many others, six out of 40, there are many others that couldn't access. And it shows something needs to happen for us to reach out those that couldn't access the funds because they didn't have the fundamentals in place. I wanted to touch just a little bit on what the principles of Sukuma are that we agreed upon. Humanity, where there's a spirit of compassion, where we are trying to reach out to our businesses out there. Because if you think about it, businesses are not created by AI or some robots. They are created by people. They can access information, but you still need a person to drive that. So humanity is very key to a business happening. We are very impartial in who we consider for assistance, independent. The decision to fund or not assist the business is based on the facts that are brought to the table. Not because you know Arnold, not because you know Untatu David. It's because the fundamentals are in place. We look at unity, where we had a spirit of making sure that we work as one to overcome the challenges that our businesses were facing, and neutrality and objectivity. I thought those are very important principles to say, so that you understand where Sukuma comes from in terms of us now taking a step further beyond the COVID period and saying, what, it is, what is it that we can do to assist entrepreneurs further with the challenges that they are facing? And that leads us then to then, why do we think technical assistance is necessary for our businesses? I think during that period it became clear that unless we have some form of technical assistance that we can help our entrepreneurs with. Because many of them, when it was time to click the button, remember we opened this thing on the 3rd of April. He raised his manja. You need to submit your information because by the 6th we already have 40,000. If you don't have your financials in place, what do you think are your chances of getting that relief? So we thought, because so many people didn't have financial statements, they didn't have the compliance record in order, they didn't have the know-how of how to put up an application together, maybe we need to have some kind of a general technical assistance fund that will assist our people to be better capacitated, to be better ready to access opportunities. And it addresses a number of challenges, uh, technical assistance, in capacity, in your business to, uh, to provide good quality services, inappropriate technical skills. Sometimes you start something but you don't have the necessary skills to do it. This will be able to assist you there. Insufficient operative and financial management skills, and that's why we have the likes of Yusuf with us here today. Failing to capitalize on opportunities. He mentioned opportunities about tenders or contracts that you can go for, and just you lack competitiveness. So the objective is to provide our businesses, particularly those that do not know of such uh, opportunities that are available for technical assistance, to know that, guys, if you have your things in place, you can apply, and let's see what it is that we can do together. And there are many challenges that our businesses are facing. Uh, crime and corruption. Do you think crime affects businesses? Sometimes you've got your stock, Lapana, what happens? Bakshai, ne? It's gone. What do you do? So we're not saying we are, uh, we're going to replace your stock, but I'm showing the effects of crime are such that our businesses have many challenges to uh, contend with corruption. Uh, and for, it to, for you to get paid for the service, hey, Pelanami, I have to pay my, hey, so you charge this, add another 5,000 pesos, then I will pay you. Unfortunately, it eats up on your margins. That's the reality that is out there. So these are things that our businesses are facing. Appropriate technology and low production capacity. I think people need to have the right technology in their businesses. Lack of management skills, finance and obtaining credit. A lot of people need assistance therein. Access to markets and developing good relationships out there. Recognitions by large companies and government. 
all the things that you need to have in place to be able to access those opportunities, knowledge and support, and just regulatory compliance. These are the common reasons that we had for rejecting uh, those people that had applied to us. And it, it was a painful thing to do. It was not something, most of them, they were not tax compliant. Most of that could not provide evidence that they were, that they were viable before the COVID pandemic. Some of the businesses were insolvent or making losses, and yet you want to get assistance. So we say, how are you going to repay it back? And the amount applied for is often, was often outside the specified range. If we say, as business partners, the minimum loan that we take is 500000 That's the range that we start at. You can't say, no, no, hey man, give me 900000 And some people come for that. And if you say 100,000, unfortunately, we start at this amount. They say, all right, give me that 500,000. Some, there's some incongruence there. So apply within the funding range of many funders. And I think what Arnold was referring to, there are many funders in the place, scan the market and find ones. So these were the things. When we did the Sukuma, we started on 250,000 to a million rents. And people would apply outside that range. And unfortunately, we could not assist them, some of them. So through the TA program, we want to reduce the cost of doing business for our small businesses, improve access to appropriate finance, and as well support them to better manage, to support you guys better manage your businesses, to enhance your business efficiencies, and to, be, to give skills transfer where possible by leveraging the skills through mentors, through professionals that we can assign to your business to assist you with something that is probably a challenge. So, is if the way we do it, e technical assistance aid, is to provide it in the form of a loan. Uh, the guy with the juice talked about maybe certification, and maybe you don't have the funds to do so, or you could use your credit card. If you use your credit card, if you do have one, how much do you think it's going to charge you to get the certification? So these loans that we give, we will start them at about 25,000 rents. We'll go up to 250,000 rents for technical assistance. We'll provide them over 36 months. And it will give you a three months free obligation not to pay. But from month four, you have to pay it back. We don't charge any administration or raising fee. We, but we want the detailed motivation of why that technical assistance is required. There must be evidence of solvency. There must be evidence of solvency at least from a year back in that business because it's very difficult to deal with a pure startup where you cannot refer back and see what is it that you're providing technical assistance for, particularly for this program. We might consider this. It's something that we are contemplating, some kind of personal surety for that TA loan amount because it shows your commitment, as Arnold was saying. You want us, you, if you don't believe sufficiently in our business, why should we give you? Now, the good thing about this is that it's zero interest on whatever amount that you're giving. So where do you get zero interest? I was comparing that to your credit card usage. Credit card is expensive funding because that's that monthly charge that you have to pay on the outstanding balance that you owe. So I think this is an offer that when you have a genuine issue to attend to within your business, can be really leveraged. It is an opportunity that the trustees say, let's reach out to businesses that are out there that have started something and need that assistance to get to the next level to be better able to get access to funding. And hopefully some of you would be able to do that. I think uh, some of the qualification criteria, we're looking at close corporations, private companies, uh, where the directors are jointly and severally liable. Is it me or outside? It's outside, no? So um, um, I think you'll, you'll read that from the presentation slide about who we're looking at. Your, your form of incorporation is very important in how we can assist you. It must be some form of formally registered company. If you have two years of trading, uh, trading history for two years, it helps, two years or more, okay? We're looking at those with a total revenue not exceeding 20 million. It's a big stretch, so we can accommodate many, many small businesses there. 
I mentioned the detailed motivations, setting out what it is why, that you require technical assistance for. If you have financial statements for that, uh, it will help. But if your business is running for some time and it can show some kind of solvency, it's something that we can also address to assist you to put systems in place to have better finances moving forward, such as the picture that Yusuf has drawn for us here earlier. Okay? And if you don't have those financial statements because we don't want to exclude, at least have 12 months financial, uh, have a, in 12 months bank statements because you don't have financial statements, you can refer to something that when we procure the services of somebody like a Yusuf or any other professional accountant that we can put to, they've got something to work off to be able for us to take it forward. And then we'd like to have confirmation of a bank account by a relevant bank. So it, I think that's important for us to know that whoever that we are trading with is a person that has been FICAT, it's a formally registered business, that this assistance, they don't take it as, um, you know, just a grant, it's a business. A grant doesn't give you the discipline to run that business as it's supposed to be run. Okay? I mentioned there, that one of um, signed of financial statements, if needs be, or latest management accounts, or bank statements, I think that is a repetition, confirmation of bank account, copy of ID, and your tax compliance certificates, if you do have. If not, it's something that we can assist with. Submission of latest available statements, or any credit agreements that you have, as well as the motivation and supporting documenting, documentation illustrating clearly the need for that technical assistance. Now, we won't give technical assistance to just in everything. We've got a few things that we wanted to clarify. This is what we can do. We can help you to create or enhance your production uh, and or distribution of products or services. We can provide legal assistance in terms of licensing, certification, trademarks or patients. So the certification, I'm looking specifically at that because it's something that will put your business on a better footing. I don't know what certification you're looking for, but if you're going to distribute to the broader market, they want to know that the product is safe and it's not going to result in the formal listeriosis kind of things that we had previously. Creation of customized accounting or management information system, that is something we can assist with. Installation of, um, of, of one-time acquisition or installation of software, you can look at how to better manage your books. I think you have a number of them, Yusuf, in place. Normally, how much do they cost? How much does Sage cost? As a subscription. Yeah, so the one time when you need to get that thing in place, we will assist you with that, but for you to maintain that, you need to maintain it going forward. Not, we won't pay the subscription for you going forward, but we'll assist you to get it. And then we can give you tailored and ongoing mentoring by experienced service, uh, mentors, but it's important that you know that it's not a grant, it's something that you can use. So if you get this, let's say 6,000 for a one-time installation, let's say 6,000 rents, and you have 36 months to pay it. It's not bad, ne? how much is it? Calculate quickly. <laughs> I thought I want to put you on the spot. <laughs> How much is 6,000 over, let's say, 30, because it's over 36 months, so you'll pay over 33 months. Hmm? 150 rands? No interest? Will you pay it back? Well, team, win. I don't know. <laughs> what we want to do with TA is to pay for your equipment, materials, or supplies of the business. It doesn't cover that normal funding of your business. There are many funders that will consider that. We just provide the technical assistance for you to be on a better footing to get access to that funding. Uh, we won't um, provide you financial assistance, as I said. We won't fund you for general education. Hey, Mfunuktoli degree, MBA, that we won't do. We won't fund you for, for you for you to get your degree or diploma or that type of thing. And uh, before too, our guys, Malapi municipality, province, I want to lobby them good so we get business. We want fund you for lobby. <laughs> uh, any cost associated with lobbying and that type of thing is crossing the line. 
we want the substance of that. Um, and then I think we've been complaining a lot about uh, things that are done illegally. This fund is not available for us to do anything that is outside of the South African law. So everything, we're looking at ex seeing, exploring the type of services that we can do, but as a start, certification, make, getting financial management in place, getting your compliance in place is a quick start of what you can do because it's one thing for us to tell you here that it's, you must comply, uh, you must get your financial statements in order, uh, and, and, and you know, certifications, and then we go away. It was a nice talk, we are away. But technical assistance is saying, this is something that you can put your business on a better footing to have those, place, those things in place. The reasons why I talked about the crisis that happened in 2020, which none of us had anticipated. Who of us had anticipated what happens, what happened with the floods now, was it last month in KZN? We can't go to the extent of just saying, ah, that was KZN, we are fine here. What happens if it comes here? Will you be ready to apply for any form of assistance if you do not have your financials in order, if you do not have your compliance? So let's give that businesses some tender care love, that TLC that it requires, and leverage what tools are available from 25,000 to about 250,000. I think very few people are gonna require that much. And we will work around to see how can we do it in such a manner as to incorporate as many people as possible in this technical assistance fund. So for now, we are, we are busy preparing uh, an online application uh, platform for people to be able to submit their motivation to give us the basic information of their businesses for us to take it forward. That is still underway, but we said, let's fly this plane. We'll fix as we are flying in the air. So we're getting off. You are the first one to get to know about this general technical assistance that Suguma is availing uh, to yourselves. So for now, if any one of you is interested in applying for this technical assistance, you can apply to inquiries at businesspartners.co.za. And then I think we'll then be able to process it from that. And I, I hope when you go through this um, um, information, you'll be able to see that there is a tool available to you to get your business on the right footing, to get yourself compliant, to get yourself your financial statements in order, and we'll look at the number suit. And you know, some of the things, for instance, uh, a, a stock management system, if you are in a situation where you, you, you don't know what your stock is and you wanna know that there's no shrinkage happening in your business, that is something that we can uh, consider. Uh, things like how you link your stock to your cash registers, these are things that you are beginning to consider and we are thinking as broad as is possible. Through your inquiries, we will enrich what it is that we can cover with our technical assistance so long it doesn't fall, as it doesn't fall within the non-allowable technical assistance things. Uh, thank you. As they say, brevity is the soul of wit. You know, you don't want about to abakulu my skirt. I got ill out, I got in. So I'm as brief as is possible. Thank you, eh? Thank you so much. Um, I'd, I'd ask you to please just join me yet again. Sorry. So that whatever questions you might have or have, um, we could answer them. And, and I think this is the best opportunity. Yeah, everyone, Arnold, Yusuf. Please come join me. Let's do a, a Q&A. Then after this, this then concludes our program for the day. After this Q&A, we'll grab some to drink, eat, and call it a day. Um, any questions? I mean, I've got a, I like, I like how diplomatic you are. Uh, if I, they do not find lobbying. <laughs> I, could, I, could, I, could, I could directly call that bribing. <laughs> uh, indirectly. Um, okay, cool, guys. Questions? Maybe I'll take the first five gentlemen. Um, okay, cool. Hope. Other mic? Second mic? Oh, perfect. Please, please start with the gentleman at the back. We'll come with you, uh, my lady. 
and then the gent over here. So this is the first three, and then we'll just keep having a conversation. Morning. My name is Norman Swartz. I run a company called Z Snacks. We deal with edible nuts, dried fruit, cashew nuts, bodybuilding, and so on. So I propose business to you as well. You're a customer of mine. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the event. It's really important because I think for me as a, you know, you are the, you are the road runner by yourself when you are first generation business people. You go into this thing blind. You hit anything that can hit you. And you try to survive and you try to stay. So for me, there are three things, one of each of your, your, your panelists. I think in the first one, I'm discussing with Yusuf to get me compliant. I know it's not easy, step by step. I've been in business since 2014. I failed to raise funds since 2014. In the industry that I've worked for 25 years, I've got industry experience crazy. I can, I can land a plane blindfolded in a storm. I can't make money to pay myself. How's that? It's crazy. So what I'm saying today is that I, I'm grateful for this opportunity because I think as we are the people of who owns the land, whether it is commonly known or not, we can never be just on lookers of other people's success. And next best thing becomes the mob that grabs from you because you've got a sustainable business. I think we as a society, we need to become more of everything that is needed for us to succeed as black people. So that's my fundamental belief. I believe in that. From Yusuf, you and I are ongoing. Yusuf has opened my eyes to many things. And I've always looked at affordability as the hemorrhaging thing. To say, no, Yusuf is a CA, Jesus Christ. You know, it's another plate to feed. You think small like that to say, the business then becomes how many people do you feed, including yourself. So you become the business. I am trying to transition from working in the business to working on the business. Yusuf is part of the people who's helped me to start thinking that way. So for me, it's ongoing. Number one, an accounting software package. I struggle with the Excel spreadsheets sometimes. The thing does what it does. I'm confused. And when I'm confused, the business is confused. You don't have compliance. Your systems fail you. I could do for another person that I worked for years ago, seven, eight hundred thousand rand a month. I can't do 10% of that for me. So inefficiency robs you of capital. So for me, I'm in that transitioning phase where I've been rejected for funding from everyone who's ever said they've got funds for any reason. I've been rejected simply because of lack of compliance. So for me, I'm, I'm clear about that. Software package and facility that is cheap enough for a person not to feel that your legs are being cut before you leave the gate. Two, business partners. Business partners to me has meant they come, they take your business. They come with money, one million by the time they leave, your business is worth five million, and now you need to pay them their share from five million. Is it another loan that you must get to take them out of your business? That's for business partners. For Sakuma, you know what? I've heard of you for the first time today. I'm delighted to hear what you are saying. I've got transition in my operations where I want to leverage on particular products that I can sell into our local markets. And I haven't been successful because I cannot get the raw material in tonnage. I'm trying to transition my operations to make sure that I can produce those tonnage in an agreed amount of period of time. So efficiency then becomes the motivator or the profit for me. So those are the three questions that I've got. Thank you very much. So, no, no, before you hand the mic back, maybe to get clarity, are we clear on the questions? Perfect. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for the question about business partners and the name and the idea that business partners takes a share in your business and you, you have to take a loan out to get us out. So I think, first of all, the name business partners was created not for in the sense that we become a partner in your business, but more that we are more than a bank. We provide funding, but we want to aid you with mentorship, with networks, um, and know-how that you would expect from a, 
from a partner. In terms of our funding, before COVID, only uh, investing in, in businesses where we take a shareholding was only about 2% of all our transactions. I'm talking about taking a share in a specific business. Uh, during COVID, I don't think there was one, David. Uh, but our, our idea is we will only take a share in a, in a trading business if the potential of that business is, is, is blue sky and it doesn't make sense for that business to repay cash now, rather use it to make more money. Um, so that is, in a nutshell, the, the ideology or the logic in the name. And in terms of our application finance, uh, with trading businesses, it's, it's virtually 1%, 2% of all our transactions. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Norman. I'm so excited that you actually came through. Um, and I think, you know, that Norman is the type of entrepreneur who I meet a lot, who's passionate, hardworking, uh, investing so much of themselves into their business, but not just seeing any of the financial returns. And yet he has, he has a fantastic business that's definitely, that is definitely going to be going places. In terms of getting started, so what I often say is this, if you don't have any money, there's no money left, and you still want to get started, the SME Toolkit is always your go-to place. You know, it's a tool which we use for entrepreneurs. You download all of the templates, you populate it, the formulas are preset, um, and you know, it will automatically work out and you'll get the basic started. The other option thereafter is that if you look at, if you look at quite a few of the banks, quite a few of the banks who operate in the SME space, these days give you access to accounting software. Sometimes you don't have to even pay a cent for it. It's included as part of your business for banking account. But the next step up, if you then want to go and use accounting software, I think, you know, it's just a matter of perspective. So for example, think about how much we pay for fuel, right? I mean, we're paying like about 20 man a liter. Um, you know, for accounting software to spend about 300, 500 rand a month, that's like about 20 liters of fuel, right? And how far does that actually get you? But the value that it brings to your business and the return on investment that you get is simply multiplied several times over. So I think, you know, what I would often say is take a look at your business and say to yourself, you know, where can you cut costs so that you can spend 300 rand or 500 rand a month, you know, on accounting software? Honestly, you know, I mean, uh, it's really not a lot. And just within the first few months of using it and, and actually investing it, you will be shocked at the difference it makes. I mean, we see it every day with the entrepreneurs. So, you know, that, that would be my suggestions in terms of where you can get started. Now, thank you for that. It's always good to see people who are doing something in spite of the challenges and those growing pains that you're encountering. Uh, I, you know, when we had 40,000 applications, my assumption was that many people know Suguma, but quite clearly, that's why I thought, let me introduce a little bit of the history of where Suguma come from. And I think part of our responsibility in being in institutions such as ourselves is to try and avail these opportunities to entrepreneurs who really need it and can use it to good aid. So what you're talking about was improving your efficiencies in your business so that you can make that step change to be able to access better opportunities. That is smack bang, something that should be considered within a technical assistance uh, uh, fund that we are providing. But it's important that people realize that we give you a soft loan effectively. It's a soft loan that doesn't pay any interest. The more you're able to you know, commit to paying back whatever we give you to improve your efficiencies when your efficiencies improve, then you are able to help others. So it's something that you should apply. I'm glad that you worked with uh, uh, Yusuf. He's a good partner, one of our mentors. And I'll tell you for one, he doesn't need to be a mentor. He does it out of the passion of assisting entrepreneurs. So this is a relationship that we can look at within the package of saying, okay, maybe this accounting software would be good for you. I don't know if you are banking with any bank that they give you some of these packages. So depending on whatever is suitable and is fit for purpose, is something that we'll consider, so long as the motivation is strong enough so that we know that we are looking at it impartially, independently, and based on economic merit, it's something that we will consider.
Um, good morning, my name is Amanda. I just want to thank everyone from the tea team for inviting us once again. I also want to thank all the speakers for giving us a lot of knowledge that we obviously lack on our side and we're trying to you know, put together in order to make our businesses work as individuals and entrepreneurs. So my question has, um, it's actually directed to Yusuf. Um, in the process of applying for some funding, um, I'd gone to a fu another a funding seminar and you spoke a lot about compliance and getting ready in, you know, so that you don't have to actually worry about when you have to fill in applications, you know what I mean? It's a small thing, uh, maybe to you as someone who actually has more knowledge on the topic, but for me, it was very hard to find my tax clearance certificate for my business. I've gone on the tag, um, sorry, it's the SARS website. Um, I've done everything that they requested me to do. And the document that I get is actually a blank document. It doesn't give me any information on my tax clearance. So my question is, what can I actually do in order for me to acquire that document? Okay, so thank you for that. So I think, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs do struggle to obtain their tax or clearance. And the first thing you have to understand is that uh, when, you are, when you are registered on e-filing, SARS is going to look at all, all the taxes for all the tax years <laughs> in respect of all the businesses that you are associated, right? And these days, you know, I mean, you might have one VAT return outstanding or one income tax return outstanding for one year, and that's going to hold it back up. So, so I think, so the first thing is, you know, it is, it is always important before you even apply for it on, online is to go and check that all your records are up to date because in some cases, entrepreneurs apply but they already have outstanding tax matters, which is definitely going to automatically hold it up. If all your tax affairs are in order and they've been submitted, then you must also understand that the taxes also have to be paid. <laughs> so, so simply because you've submitted a tax return, but you haven't paid it and you now have, have outstanding tax liability, if you haven't entered into a payment arrangement for that, that's going to also hold it up. Um, assuming that is in place uh, in terms of the payment and the settlement of the tax liabilities, then when you submit your tax return, in certain, in certain instances there could be issues in terms of a system, a system issue and you might need to actually go and contact the call center because in certain instances even when you have to download the responses, you, know, uh, you may not be able to, to actually understand it. There have also been times in the past where because they used to make use of, for example, Adobe Flash, you know, people will go and for downloads it, but then they cannot easily view it. So you just need to be aware of those things. You can obviously go and try to call them, get a reference number, escalate it, and follow it up. Please understand that the turnaround times can sometimes take a lot longer than what you expect, and you have to plan for that as well. And of course, if you have filed your tax returns with, with your bookkeeper, then they can obviously lodge that if they are registered as a tax practitioner. Otherwise, you would have to contact them and take that further on your own. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have one question. It's, hey, yeah, I have one question. It's directly to Mr. Arnold. Um, my question, I think the gentleman over there gave a nice prelude. It's for funding. I think so much as entrepreneurs, especially under the economic climate we're in, we find ourselves so desperate for funding. So I just wanted to turn the tables a bit because funders always give uh, uh, certain requirements of what businesses need in order to have access to funding. But for entrepreneur, what should we look out for in terms of uh, uh, like a potential funder? Because the way I see it, a funding is like a marriage. You don't just wanna get funding for someone who 10 years down the line, you're like, I, Mara, this is not the person that I wanted to get in bed with. So what advice would you give to uh, up and coming entrepreneurs that you know, this is the kind of funding uh, you should actually look for, or what you should be worried of? Just if you could touch on that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's actually a very good question. And there's variations or variables that needs to be taken into account. So the first one, I suppose, would be in what stage of business you are in. If you are 
in the research and development stage of your business, you're not going to get funding at a traditional institution. Uh, you would have to look at um, at venture capitalists or you'd have to look at uh, people that, that fund grassroots potential and they would normally do it on equity uh, participation with the hope that as you go to phase two or phase three of your growth, that there would be an exit for them. Um, obviously, if you grow further and you're in your first stage of, of growth, then you can uh, apply it for funding at your institutions, um, the traditional institutions, uh, or if you need funding that would maybe have a high impact on a community or in the country, then development funding would would suit you. So it depends on the stage of the business you are in, the purpose of uh, the impact that you want to create, whether it is just driven by profits or whether it's driven by um, other measures like job creation and skills transfer and development. There are institutions out there. And I think the third one perhaps is, what is your core objective in growth? Would you like to uh, be uh, a premier player in Gauteng? in the country, in Africa, or globally. Because if you're going to have a, gro a global presence as a core objective, it opens up your funding opportunities, perhaps to global funders uh, that could pro provide you with funding as well as uh, networks uh, to, to play with in that landscape. Thank you. If I can just add on to that, it's important to always understand what is, what is the total cost of funding and the purpose that you're going to be using it to. Too many entrepreneurs tend to get into funding agreements, and then they discover that, you know, there are service fees, administration charges, additional cost involved, or down the line, even if they're going to use that funding towards, if a contract, their margin on that contract is way too low, but now, you know, um, that deal, even though it looks so good when they went into it, was actually not gonna be in their best interest. So for that reason, I am really excited in terms of the fact that you are the first ones to have the opportunity to apply here for an interest-free loan. Because I mean, you know, those types of opportunities don't come around often. Uh, it gives you the flexibility over, over a reasonable term, which also allows you to also invest, build the business, and then go and pay back the loan. So I think, you know, that is quite a fantastic opportunity that you simply don't get quite often. Yeah, I just want to amplify the response that Arnold gave also. From you as an entrepreneur, important thing that you need to ask yourself, um, what is the funding need in your business? Because then you can match it with the, the type of funders that provide that. Is it a short term or a long term need? Okay, what can the business afford? Can it afford whatever repayments that the funders or the terms that the funder requires? And then what will it give up in exchange for that funding? Is it equity? Is it some form of collateral that you'll be able to give up you as an entrepreneur? So that, these are questions that you need to ask yourself and then you scan the marketplace in terms of which funders are available. Then you can match whatever opportunity. I think, I, I sense that you're very good at the dating game, the same. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Leilani, for even doing this uh, type of event because we as entrepreneurs, we, it's a bit troubling, for example, to get opportunities. For example, I, I recently started a startup which is take, called Texas Capital. I'm a co-founder. But now the problem is access to capital. For example, we want to tap in into the market. We are an accredited uh, credit provider. We already have a license. But now the problem is uh, our business is going to be a gearing business. We want to borrow uh, money for new minibus taxi owners to buy minibus taxis because the problem is, the problem that we're trying to solve is that only two, two out of 10, which is 20%, are only uh, affordable to apply to a bank and the bank able to fund, uh, fund them. The only uh, institution that's able to do that is SA Taxi and is the only institution that does that. So now there is no, uh, another opportunity where these guys can go and access uh, uh, capital. So I, I, I have uh, skills from a bank. I used to work for Standard Bank, and I used to work for credit. So I understand the life cycle of the credit management and 
how are we going to help these guys? But now the problem is access to capital. I went to IDC, NEF, GEP, all these institutions, and they say they can't find the model. The model itself is it's going to work, but now the thing is we don't have access to capital. So now, as I've been rejected in all these institutions, now they told me that, uh, for example, CIFA. CIFA said, okay, go start. At least start with two minibus taxis. And two minibus taxis cost of almost 1.1 uh, million, which is 550 one minibus taxi. And I don't really have that amount of access to maybe networks that would help me or maybe bootstrap the company itself. So now, as I stand where I am right now, I don't know where to go given the fact that I am the first generation of entrepreneurs at home. My grandfather owned minibus taxis and they helped me to go to school, get education, I have a big honors because of that. But now I have to give back myself because I know that, for example, as a taxi charge 26.5 uh, of interest rates, which is very, very, very high. So as we come into the market, we know there's access to the market itself because people are looking for, for example, how are we gonna position ourselves? How are we gonna position ourselves to give at least a interest rate that is way below than the 26%. So the, pro the issue now that I'm asking from you guys is that how can I access capital if these high institutions don't really fund the idea itself because of what I'm trying to do is to be a credit provider. Thank you. I think this one I want to give to Arnold first. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, for the question and, and kudos to you too for being an entrepreneur. Um, and I suppose it is a difficult industry with, with everything that, that, uh, that goes into it because the industry itself is seen as a challenging industry, and I suppose, as you said, from a funding perspective, uh, people say no before they even look at the application. In terms of your options, um, there, there, are, there are only a few that I can think of. So a lot of, a lot of institutions um, specialize in movable assets funding, and a lot don't. Business partners, we don't really... Uh, fund transportation in general because it's not a uh, it's not it's not a niche market that we specialize in. Uh, but there are other funders. There are the West Banks and the Stanix and 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 others um, that could assist you with that. Um, so your options, I suppose, would be to go through the to those institutions and ask what is the the loan to value that they will give. So if it's a, a 1.1 million rand loan, they might only want to give 800,000, right? Then you have to put on equity, which you either raise then uh, in your personal networks or in your business networks. So that is an option. Um, it will definitely reduce the cost of, of the money, which you stated at about 20 plus percent, um, because you would then take the bite out of the risk. The second one uh, would be other funders uh, that alternative funders like Lula Lend, um, as well as crowdfunding. You could pitch your, your proposal on a crowdfunding platform, for example, and you'd have community uh, individuals uh, uh, give you an investment so you could raise a thousand rand by a thousand individuals, and that could be another way of, of maybe just getting into it. Because you rightfully said, once you get in the first two, the next two is a lot easier, and there's a snowball effect with getting off the ground. Um, so that is, those are the funding institutions I can think of. The Taxi Association you've mentioned already. Uh, we, we actually have entrepreneurs in that industry. Um, and then I don't know if any of my panel members might want to add to it. Yeah. The, the other thing I picked up from you, you want to set up a fund to fund taxi owners. Is that what you're saying? So... Most funders, such as ourselves, don't fund for on lending purposes. So you need to, it's almost like you're raising, you're setting up your own fund. So I think you need to, I don't know, the SA, SME fund was one of those institutions. Yeah, they they, they they've run out of funds. Yes, yes. They've placed all the funds. So I think there's the need in the country for us to have a, a new fund set up because it was a partnership. It was supposed to be a partnership between government and corporates. I think it's a challenge for this country, especially for those that are wanting to get into the funding space, because new people that are coming in need to have some kind of funding. 
you need to give them the confidence that you can do it. Perhaps like the CIFA guys have told you that maybe start with two before you can get others to invest you in you to have a fund and push that model that you can give. It's a challenging environment, I know, uh, especially since it's an exclusion from our side. You seem to have the, very, the requisite skills to get into that industry. All I can say is not, don't give up. Look at the international market as well. Look at donor funds. Uh, to try and raise a fund for that particular purpose, but they, want, they will want to see some kind of ocular proof that this is something that you can do with the first two maybe that you have raised for yourself and maybe on sell them and that. Without ocular proof, it's not going to be that easy to raise the fund. I mean, that's, we have to say it as it is, but I think it's a lofty thing. One thing I like about Arnold is the, what he raised is the issue of crowdfunding. When I grew up, my parents were doing both stock fail, for me, Stockwell was some form of crowdfunding, but we used it not so much for productive purposes. We were using it for funerals or parties, and maybe it's something within ourselves that we need to begin to look at. How can we leverage the opportunities from crowdfunding to let our dreams come true? Because that will give people in the traditional financing space the confidence and opportunity to back such entrepreneurs when it does happen. For now, that's the best I can give you as a response. I don't know if Yusuf, you want to say anything? I think, you know, uh, at times it can often feel like a chicken and an egg, you know, where you're trying to get the funding, but you can't get the funding, so now you can't actually start this. And I, I understand how it can feel so frustrating because you're obviously quite passionate about this. You can see it for yourself, but other people just can't see it the way you do. So often there are two things. Um, so the first thing is that um, when you go into any industry, in you'll find it's always a lot easier if you sometimes form a team. Because at the moment, just trying to do it on your, on your own might set up too many barriers, whereas getting a strong team behind you to also support what you want to do also lends a lot more of the credibility to the business venture itself. The other one is that often people do look for a track record, and the easiest way to go do that is that a lot of the funders are looking for the clients that you want to fund. So all you have to do is go and find some really good deals for them, take it to them, give it to them. They might even pay you a commission or a small fee, which, which is not going to be a lot. But that's going to immediately demonstrate to them that you can actually understand the market, identify those who should be backed. And once you've taken a, a few of those good deals, it becomes easier for them to even want to try to partner you and try to also see how they can take that forward, you know? And that doesn't take a lot of time and effort, but it does mean that you have to connect yourself into the industry a lot more deeper. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Lamola. I am the founder of the Lamola Foundation. Well, my question is to Daima. Hey, Daima. Hey, Kyalla. <laughs> hey, Kyalla. Uh, when you fund an entrepreneur, do you also look at age? Because, um, well, some funders, I went to some potential funders, um, the, the look they gave me, it was like, hey, this one will appear when I blow it, this one. So do you look at age or anyone? Do you fund anyone? Thank you. You know, I mean, I'm going to touch on something maybe somewhat related uh, you look at the unemployment figures of the country, okay? And uh, I think we were running at about 30-something percent, the last I checked, official unemployment. Yeah, yeah. It was, so so it, it could be, I mean, that's the official stats, I think, was about 37 percent. And then you look at, those are those that are still looking for work. If you add those that are... Um, Discouraged work seekers, it's a higher percentage. I think it says amongst young people it's about 60-something uh, percent of unemployment. I mentioned when we started off that those of you or those amongst you that are doing something about it and looking for entrepreneurial opportunities are those that, are, that need to be supported. So age, it can actually work out positively for you because you still have the energy and you can pursue something, but you need to have the wherewithal. And wherewithal, I'm talking to some of all of these things that we're looking at. That's far more important for us in spite of your age. 
Uh, if you look at international stats about people who started their, their, their businesses very young, the, the founder of Facebook, uh, the founder of whatever companies internationally, they were very young when they started this. So if you can showcase that you've got a good idea, you've got the energy to pursue it, and uh, you've got all the necessary things that you give a funder compliance, it should work in your favor than against you, more so in this country with the high levels of unemployment. And you must scan the market, as you say. There are those agencies that are looking specifically at youth. Once you've scanned, you can look at the funding purpose of that agency. Most of us are wanting to look, reach targets of certain youth that we can fund in our thing, but that doesn't obviate the need for the fundamentals to be in place. So age doesn't work against you, but make sure that you leverage the opportunities to be strong and that you're not judged based on your age, but because on the merits of your business, it can be funded in spite of your age. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Guguletu, and I would like to say thank you to T and to you guys for your time in coming here to um, help us with the knowledge. I'm from a company called Hambuzawiya Empire, and the company has been operating for the past 10 years. Now, my dad has been copying and pasting the compliance system, and unfortunately, he passed on a year ago. So now, with the knowledge of coming into the tea uh, workshops, I'm helping the business to, with their compliance system and everything else. So now, there are businesses within the properties and I've realized that the compliance issue is painful and it's joyous. So I, I want to help the businesses also to be compliant. So I wanna ask now that with that, do we apply for them for the funding or do we teach them on how to apply for the funding? Because the benefit is that our property develop as we help them to develop. Because these businesses have been operating for the past three years under my dad's leadership. But now with the new system that we're coming into, I'm just trying to have all the system to be in place. So I think it's a compliance issue. I think it's a um, compliance um, um, issue um, because okay. also, also a ethic issue. If, um, if we are applying for them, you know, to um, upgrade our property, are we? Is that in order? Yeah, I'm hearing. I'm hearing two things from what you're saying. I pick up that it, it looks like you have a property which has tenants which are entrepreneurs yes. themselves. So yes, for you as a business, you need to put yourself on a stronger footing. And I don't know if you want to improve the space that they are operating at, and it's something that you can use and leverage to get access for funding for yourself. Yeah. I don't know where your property is at, the nature, you know, if you have an independent valuation, that's an opportunity for yourself. And also, if you want to have compliant affairs, you can look at yourself as an entrepreneur. What are the areas of compliance where I'm weak at? And then the entrepreneurs themselves, yes, you can be, uh, you can make the clarion call. We are making the clarion call at the moment, say, hey guys, the reasons why we are not able to fund is that most of our, the people who come to us, are not compliant. They do not have financial statements in order. Make them aware, guys, I've, I've been to a workshop that does this. It's best for them to apply for themselves because they are independent entrepreneurs. I would prefer for them to apply for themselves because they see the value in being compliant, in being able to move to the next level rather than, than you apply on their behalf. So that, uh, and then you can tell them about, it. by the way, there's this technical assistance fund that is aimed at helping people to be more compliant, to be on a better footing, to be able to apply further. I think for me, from what I'm hearing your question say, that's what my response can be. Yusuf, I don't know if you're hearing any different. No, it's fine, no, it's fine. That's, am, am I responding to you well? You did. <laughs> where, where are the gaps? Okay, let me just hear his answer. No, no, I was just gonna say that you have an opportunity, look, you, you, it's, it's their business, they must apply, but you have an opportunity as a service provider to highlight the aspects of compliance for them. Um, they are the people that's going to sign surety, that's going to fill in the forms, that's going to have to stand good for the money. But as a service provider, you could uh, share the knowledge and you could assist them perhaps with the application, uh, but um, only as an intermediary. 
Um, and I wasn't also sure if your clients that you're referring to are tenants or are you providing a consulting in the... Just maybe no. just elaborate they, a bit more. They are tenants. So it's a property business where they are also running their businesses within the property. Okay. But I think it's a good opportunity for you to perhaps host an event at your place for them um, and, and pull some people in. Thanks. And we'll charge you. You'll pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. no, but I don't know. Are you also providing a service as a consultant to them? Yes, I'm actually running a marketing company. Oh, so, so you're a marketing company. Yeah. So you want to be a marketing service provider? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> when I, you can also, we also have mentors on our books. Okay. As if you want to be a mentoring service person, you can also apply. We will assess you independent. How do I sell my chickens? <laughs> to the marketplace. <laughs> but we have got a way of assessing who we take on as service provider, so you can also consider that. Oh, yeah. Good morning once again, Khawelo from Mogat. Um, my question is, you know, there's a sense of, uh, you know, amongst entrepreneurs when it comes to funding, that once you get funding, you just run to the sunset and everything is solved. I just wanted to understand what are the consequences of not being able to meet or pay the, the, the funding requested um, as an entrepreneur, number one. Number two, um, also whenever we ask for funding, right, um, in the business, everything changes. Um, most of the time it changes, like for instance, COVID happened, floods happened, um, and those are the challenges we maybe as a business, according to your business plan, you didn't foresee, and obviously may um, affect you, you paying that, 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 that funding that you requested. So in a nutshell, question is, what are, the what are the consequences if you are not able to, to meet the payment, especially on unforeseen circumstances? Thank you. Uh, I don't want to speak too quickly, but um, as Arnold mentioned earlier on, I'll speak about us. Uh, we, uh, the, the, word, the name business partners talk to us trying to understand the, the circumstances in your business as best we can. So we would look, what are the circumstances behind the challenges that got you to the situation that you're at? If we do give you relief over a particular period, how long would you take you to come back to normalcy and be able to repay the thing? The issue is that if it's not a grant, the business must be committed towards paying back that which it has loaned because that gives you the track record and ability to go through uh, even you know, when you want to fund growth. We can fund growth with you if it's on the other side and we realize that you've got the integrity and you're sharing all the information that uh, we require when we do require it and the circumstances are outside of your control, such as the floods, such as the COVID, there's some form of relief that will come through. Sukuma was relief, providing relief to the broader marketplace, but so did business partners to those that are their clients who say, okay, your circumstances are this, we'll give you so much for you to get to be on a good footing, but you need to be able to showcase that you'll be able to repay for it. Uh, I'm going to give to Arnold to give a bit more detail. Right. So would that be another finding on top of that? Uh, you know, in the to okay. I'm going to give Arnold so I don't speak out of turn. Thanks for the question. I'm going to be brutally honest and then I'll tell you our philosophy. W what are the consequences? The consequences, you can lose everything. All right? You sign surety, you give up your house, you um, pledge, I don't know, everything. Uh, whatever you pledge, you can lose. And beyond that, the people that you employ lose and there's a ripple and a domino effect. So that is di a direct answer to your question. But in between... Um, the, there is a philosophy that a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of funders of entrepreneurs have. And within business partners, we ask a question. What went wrong? Was it your fault? Was it within your control? If an entrepreneur embezzled money or made silly mistakes and caused the business to, to, to go into the red, um, what, what can we do? I mean, you can't do deals or, 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 or run, run the relationship further. So there you will have to probably a process to, to, to legal and, and, uh, and fight it out, if, I, if I'm honest. 
but we have a lot of entrepreneurs who are, as you said, with COVID and the consequences of COVID, who are in a pickle not because of their own doing. We have entrepreneurs uh, who's in student accommodation, who's not receiving money, who's in um, nursing uh, industry, who's not receiving uh, money, who, and, and, and in the uh, tourism industry, who's just, it was out of their control. In that case, business partners' philosophy is let's keep the ball rolling, let's, let's, um, let's not close the business, let's maintain, let's try and get the business maintained out of the situation. And, and I think that is where the relationship um, comes into play. And, and I suppose um, other institutions uh, within, I can't speak for everybody, but I suppose within their mandate would have to um, take an approach of what was the reason for, for, for the cause and what the consequences will be uh, linked to that. Thanks. It is, it, it is said that we live in a world where entrepreneurs work so hard to build a business only to lose it in a very short space of time. And if you think about it, we live in times which are very uncertain, unpredictable. In 2020, we were hit by COVID. In 2021, we had our looting and for riots. In 2022, we've now had floods. And the point is the default position for most entrepreneurs when we have to deal with them is that they'll say, you know, so this happened, I didn't expect it to happen, you know, it wiped out my business. And absolutely bad things happen to all of us. But the point is bad things are always going to happen. In 2023, there might be something. In 2024, there might be something. The most important thing is how well do you build your business to weather the storm? And that means on the one side, have I put in some of the measures such as, for example, do I have an emergency fund? Have I set up the business so that if something happens, I can quickly get maybe 20,000 man or 30,000 man. I have a lifeline, a credit line, which is available to me. Do I have customers, partners, suppliers who have a vested relationship because they want to work with me so that when something bad happens, I can pick up the phone and say, you know, I really need the stock. Can you just help me out for the next few months? And they say, sure. Have I invested and done that during the good times? Because it is during the good times, the investments we make in compliance, in, in terms of the relationships, in terms of our finances, that pay off multiple times when something bad happens. It's only then you discover who is on your side and who's going to help you. The second thing is this. When bad things happen, how quickly do you move? I dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs when COVID first started in the first month. It was, no, it's okay. We're just going to wait for things to come back to normal. You know, you know we just want to flatten the curve. You know, that was the messaging. But it never came back to normal. And five months later, their cash flow was gone and their business was gone. When shocks happen, the speed of the response is crucial. Get on the phone with your accountant. Speak to your mentor in that day. Uh, and formulate your plan in that week because you are losing time and you're losing cash. And then when you then go for funding, any fund is going to look at your cash flow, they're going to look at the business, and they're simply going to say, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. And lastly, keep your funder on your team. A lot of entrepreneurs go quiet, you know? They will go quiet and you'll wonder what's happening. Are you still there on the other side? <laughs> um, don't go and um, alienate your funder because that's going to also hurt you. Don't go and apply for business rescue, for example, without talking to your funder. Because all those things are just going to shoot you in the foot if you don't get your funder to work on your side. So the message is bad things happen and they will continue to happen. We can't control everything that happens to our business, but we can prepare ourselves to deal with the unexpected shocks and come out stronger. Now, go and multiply my successes on a much bigger stage. A lot of entrepreneurs try to scale up and then they find, as we often see, even if we get you into that shopping center, because we actually work with quite a few shopping centers, even if I get you there and we put you there, then it becomes, oh, you know, they told me that there are 100,000 people who come to Tuya, but these people all walk past my store and they don't even come inside. Right? So then you are set up with another issue because you haven't set up the fundamentals for that business to actually succeed in that environment. So the fundamentals are really important. You have to master that. 
in terms of your brand, in terms of who you serve, in terms of the product, to be able to take this on to a, for you to actually take this on to a bigger stage. And it's definitely possible and can be done. Yeah, thanks for that, Yusuf. Um, I think the question about franchising versus running more branches is a very important one, and it links to what Yusuf said about your purpose. And it's fine to change your purpose as you, as you grow in your business. But understand that if you want to franchise a business, your product and service changes. You are now a service provider to your franchisee. So you are providing almost a corporate services on, um, on the supply side. So you're buying in bulk and you're supplying it and you, and you, and you have bulk power. You may be providing legal or negotiations um, skills for your, on behalf of your franchisees to the landlord, um, as you said. And you have systems that deal with um, the flow and the logistics and the supply and everything. So it's a completely different mindset. Um, it's, a, it's not a bad idea, but you have to understand who you are. Um, in that whole um, uh, flow uh, and, and, and that whole supply chain. I think the second one is what you're supplying is a competitive commodity, uh, price sensitive rather. So perhaps look at other ways of supplying the same customers with alternative products. I don't know if you're also selling the bottles or if you, you know, can add the logistics to it. Or, or anything else that you can add as a product or a service that gives you more margin or more gross profit to the same customer. Um, so, so perhaps you have to, to think about it in that perspective. Um, and I think as your brand grows, your, the ability for you to, to get into those, uh, those places where the landlords are giving you a hard time now, I think that will improve um, over time as your, as your brand uh, grows. Thanks. Yeah, I think you guys have, uh, have covered it all that I wanted to say. I think for me, if I have to emphasize anything, get those fundamentals in order. That's the basis for you to go conquer the world. Yes, thanks. Um, maybe just to come in in terms of the compliance. You know, um, you know we are under a, what you call a body called Sanboa, South African Bottle Association. Then they will direct you exactly where to get your product. So you find out where they direct you. Maybe there's three or five companies that you need to maybe go buy your bottles and all that. Um, the pricing, even those that you are competing with, probably they are getting bottles at the end, but the, the pricing every year will go up. But for you to adjust also, if, if this product is well known, it's, it's selling for five rent, it must come in and you look at your logistic and all that. For example, you are also on ticket lot now. You can get water everywhere, even if you are in Cape Town. But you find out also from my shop to take the, 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 the water to take a lot and the packaging and everything, it comes bit pricey. And if I have to adjust the price also for you to get my water, it will be like, for example, 10 rand, of which one we have to, 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 to buy it. So it's also that part of the body, the, the way you have to comply, and they only direct you to the certain um, department to get. So it's a bit, it's bit technical about it, but it's fundamental. My company last year, September. Now again today, I'm learning this compliance there's different things when it comes to funding. To go back in here. So I think, you know, a starting point is always to look at the vision that you have because often what we find is when you start the business and six months or 12 months, you then take a look and say, okay, maybe, you know, I, I want to change it, you know? Or perhaps the way I initially understood it is, is not actually the way, so I need to go back and make some changes. So I think, you know, you really need to get very clear about your vision and what you want for the bar, because perhaps you want to get accreditation for something, and that's going to take you a lot longer, so now you need to start that. Something happened, and then we... So 
If you look at many successful businesses, it is because they took a lot of small steps that cumulatively contributed to their success. I think the only thing I can add is because you are young, vibrant, individual with a lot of ideas um, and changing a journal, you have to write down your ideas, write down your goals, set targets for yourself, um, but write your planning out and hold yourself accountable to it. It is helpful for me find on one specific thing. And I think uh, if you start young and you journal, it will become a very uh, important habit and, and a skill that will help you in business. Let's give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. If I can just ask the gents to ask you some of this. There's an ignorance that comes with us, especially small business owners and people want to keep understanding. And the same because zero interest rates, 36 months to pay, four months to six months of a holiday, it's a blessing for, for entrepreneurs. And I think if we need to align our compliance,